Hello and welcome. This is a podcast explaining Ukraine by ukraineworld.org. Today we will talk about the living of people in a town which is on the front line, which is on the battlefield. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm chief editor of ukraineworld.org. I'm talking to Tatyana Harkova, who is in charge of international outreach at Ukraine Crisis Media Center. Hello, Tanya. Hello. Before we start, let me remind you that you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash ukraineworld. We are spending a big amount of your support to help people affected by this war and to help Ukrainian resistance. We are also traveling a lot across Ukraine and uh, our podcast this episode, uh, in this episode we will talk uh, about our impressions from visiting Makariv. Makariv, a town near Kyiv, which was in, in March a town in the in the battlefield a town partially uh, occupied by the Russians in which the, in the part of the town the Russian troops were staying. We talked to people there, uh, we visited the destructions, we have seen lots of destructions, we, we have talked to, to these people and we will share this information with you. So, Tanya, what are your impressions of, of visiting Makariv? Yes, Makariv, um, I do remember uh, in the end of February and in March we were reading a lot about Makariv because Makariv was kind of very important uh, town. Let us explain to our listeners that Makariv is about uh, 13,000 people, population, before the war. So, and uh, in the newspapers and in website resources, it was mentioned like a battlefield. We knew that Ukrainian army controlled at least part of Makariv and some villages, but at the same time, some part of this uh, town was occupied. So, and there was an intense battle between two armies at that time. Makariv is uh, uh, located somehow to the west, uh, if you compare with Bucha and Erpin. What uh, the first impression is when you arrive to Makariv, the first thing, ma- the main building. So the main building is a culture center. So culture center with a, a monument to Taras Shevchenko in front of it. And you see the traces of missile, or we don't know, grads maybe, arrived in, uh, to this building. So a huge uh, hole in the front of this building. So it's not di- completely destructed, but this kind of uh, trace of war on it. And you, uh, when, what you see is the first impression. You see that is a kind of a humanitarian center at that moment because you see clothes, you see people active doing something, maybe distributing things in, inside this, this uh, culture center. And you see a lot of people who are very easygoing and very open to talk to you. So you have no problems. You just say, you are, uh, we are here, we are journalists, we'd like to talk to you. So they're extremely open. And uh, they are eager to tell their story. And so, interestingly, the first woman we addressed... We asked her, can, can we talk to you? And she said, about what? About humanitarian aid? No, uh, wait for this, uh, this particular person. We said, no, about the war. And she said, no, I don't want to talk about the war. And then the next 20 minutes she was talking yeah, about but look, about Yeah, the and then, then she started explaining the chronology, the, the, what was happening on the, the first days and then and later and later. So Makariv is important in, uh, as, a, as a town which lived the two kinds of life of life because we spoke to people who were not in the occupation who were kind of uh, resisting people and i was impressed by people for example the director of this culture center a woman i don't know some something like ludmila she called ludmila Ludmila, yeah uh, something 50 years old um who was extremely active, who stayed in the town and who was active during the these hard times because she was busy uh, hiring people in the underground of the center and busy with evacuating, evacuating people. Uh, she told us that she uh, managed to evacuate uh, 650 people, so it's a huge number of people. I mean, kids, first of all, mothers, but all civilians, which were unable to, to leave. She was busy with that. And uh, when you see this woman, normal woman, she was courageous enough to drive there and back, transporting people. And and other people from that center, I mean, dance teachers, I, we, we even don't know exactly, but all these people who are 
in this creative industry who were busy before they were, they were busy creating some uh, some activities with children they uh, they played an important role during the war so th- that's a very interesting thing how uh, people are changing during the war how professions kind of disappear because you are the director of the culture center and suddenly you are you are a logistics manager yeah. because you need to evacuate people you need to uh find buses which is not obvious you need to find the drivers and she told us that the young drivers who were driving these buses actually didn't have a driving pil- driving license, license. Uh, so they they could drive but they didn't have driving license they were like 18 years old to 20 years old uh, young boys and uh and suddenly th- this is it so it's 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 remarkable people who are on the front line right now are telling us that this is a place of extreme equality where you have people from very different professions but there is no arrogance of one profession against the mm-hmm. other there is this increasing uh, fantastic brotherhood and sisterhood yeah. and and as a significant detail i remember her remark when she said that on the 25th of february they put a huge flag on the building ukrainian flag and at the same time there were columns of, of tanks of russian tanks crossing um makariv and they were told by the representative of the army not to do anything so just let them go Maybe they had their own plan, but they put this flag and she was really proud. I, I, I remark this impression of she was really proud of putting this flag and this flag was present at, in Makariv during all these uh, difficult times in March. And let us come back to this building because the first impression and you, uh, I'm, I'm telling to uh, our listeners that you can watch, you can see this building on our Twitter. We we posted uh, a comment, uh, Tanya's your comment about Makariv, uh, so you can actually find it. And um, what is what is impressive with this? Uh, Uh, just go to our Twitter, Ukraine World, and uh, search Makariv in our posts. So when you see this building, you have the impression that this is a building hit by a rocket or by grads, and you cannot enter there because it, it it's going to collapse uh, the next moment, right? And there is a certain, f- like, a, f- a little fence which shows you that, okay, it's better not to enter the, the first impression you have. And then you understand that there are people entering and going and you enter the building uh, and you understand that this hall is actually on the second floor. And on the first floor, every, everything is what, everything is working, everything is functioning. There is a, a big performance hall in which people, children are now continuing their dance classes. So this is remarkable. Basically, you have the impression that the it's it's a it's a building in emergency state after the shelling, and people continue their work. This is actually now a humanitarian center. Yeah, people sound quite optimistic about uh, about the pos- the possibility to restore. We ask the question whether you are going to restart your activities for kids in September. Is usually, and they said for sure we will. So we will. We just need some some restoration for roof, for example, in case of rain or something. But we will restart what we are doing. And she was saying that they they were having activities for kids, but also for adults. And she seemed to be very proud of what they were doing before the war and the story of flag. This is one type of people. So people who resisted, but at the same time we were lucky to find people who were who were living in these parts of uh, Makariv which was occupied during this Russian presence and this is a completely different story because if in case of resistant people you see that they uh, they were on the Ukrainian side yes they were suffering from shellings uh, there were no gas no electricity and no water in um, in the town during um, during March, in fact, but in occupied uh, streets, uh, so in, in kind of suburbs of Makariv, the life was quite different because people were completely isolated in these um, quarters of, uh, of the village. They were living there without any uh, connection any news coming from Ukraine. They had no internet because there were no electricity. There were no neighbors, for example, saying where Kiev, where, where Russians are, what they are doing. So they were isolated. And a lot of people left left Makariv in the first days of war. 
And these people who were in the occupied part of Makariv, they were unable to leave. So they stayed for a month without any news from their children. As we talked to one woman, she was saying that she, she was without news about her son. She was very wor- worried about. And But these people, they were to face directly what Russians, Russians. So the Russians were living quite close to them. And here the situation is quite different and it is really tragic. We talked to a woman which is something like 53 years old and she told us the story of her neighbor, uh, of her schoolmate in fact. They uh, knew each other, these two women, for the whole their life. And uh, um, this neighbor This woman, a Russian soldier, wanted to rape her and they caught her and they were trying to to push her to a different place. And at that very moment, her husband tried to to help her, but he was shot by by Russians at that very moment. And the Russian soldier started raping her and she was happy. She was lucky enough to be to be liberated by the commander, Russian commander, saying that stop, stop that. And for the whole month, she was obliged. She lived in the house of her friend, of a schoolmate, of this woman we talked to, and she buried her husband. And Russians were living in her own house for the whole month. So people were staying inside the house. Uh, they were not allowed and they didn't want to, to go out to get food, to get information. Russians were very close. And um, this is something really terrible when you talk to people. This really traumatic experience when you are deprived of your liberty, you deprived of when you see your clothes, your relative, your husband killed, when you're yourself you're raped and you have nobody to tell to tell about that. Um, so this is a really different situation and really tragic one. Yes, yes. So, uh, and we asked, we asked this woman, she's called Oksana, who, who told us the story about her, her friend. How would you describe the, the Russian soldiers? How would you would describe the people who you talk to? Well, the first, she said that there are different types of people. There are uh, there are um, soldiers, uh, ordinary soldiers, rank and file soldiers who are very young, 18, 20 years old. She said that they were mostly from Buryatia, from uh, the Baikal region, uh, and um, and uh, they indeed they were asking this is a pattern that we that we now discover that they were asking where are the banderovits where are the ukrainian nazis the fascists and she was telling them look look at me i'm i'm probably your fascist i'm probably your banderovits and uh, they were also spreading this information that kiev has fallen and that there is no chance but basically uh, one word that she uh, actually used to describe them, it is the word dikunyo, which is a strange Ukrainian word because normally, well, it's a, it's a kind of a neologism, uh, which which kind of a means wild people, wild people, yeah. wild people, but with a certain impersonality. So not not individual wild people, but but somehow a, mess, a, mess a collection, of... a mass of of wild people. This is this is how a Ukrainian. Uh, peasant woman describes this describes these soldiers. Uh, she was telling that they were looting. They were just going from the houses with lots of lots of bags to which they they would collect the the belongings of of those people. Uh, you told us this uh, this story of a rape, uh, which was stopped by by the by the Russians themselves, but uh, the case was was there, and of co- unfortunately, it ended with the with the with the death of. of yes, and uh, once again, husband. we are not talking about uh, about a young woman. We are talking about a woman which uh, was uh, which is still is uh, fifty three years old. So they were, and we are talking about soldiers which were. 18 i don't know 19 20 years old no i think so i think like, the, in this, this case something... no in this case she was talking about the chechen well 
And uh, I think maybe he was old and maybe he was not just 18 years old. We don't know. We don't, this we don't know really. really mm, yeah. Yes. So th- this is a story uh, about that that we heard. We also not sure that that uh, that uh, this was actually a Chechen. She she called it Kad- Kadyrovitz actually, right? Uh, the the Chechens in this Kadyrov army. Uh, what else? Uh, indeed, uh, I mean we can say that. Uh, these soldiers were looting. Uh, these soldiers were killing animals, killing dogs. Yeah, they killed all the dogs. Yeah, yeah they she killed said the, they... the dogs because the dogs were kind of barking at them because they were foreigners. And this is the reaction of these soldiers. Usually, they, they just kill them. Uh, uh, they were the most importantly. They were not allowing people to move. So there was you. Uh, pe- these people in on the o- occupied streets. They were asking them, "Let us go. We are. We want to go." And uh, the response was, "We cannot let you go because you 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 saw us, so you will be able to describe us." So it's like it's about hostages. So people were were taken hostages by these Russians, um, and the, and when you are deprived of your liberty and you are deprived of information, just imagine you are in your house, you cannot go any, anywhere. You you know that Russians are here. You don't know yet that they will come that it will go away so maybe you are not sure able to survive uh, through this occupation this is something really really tragic but the woman which was talking about that she had a kind of uh, um, it was not it was not, not an anger when she was talking about russians um i even don't find a word to describe her attitude Maybe it was disgust, c- disgust. something like Ma- disgust. Yeah, yes. maybe clo- something close to disgust, like Dikunio, like like wild people. She was not, she was not really afraid of them. It was kind of she was surprising. I don't know how to say mm, these uh, these wild people who came uh, without no clear objective, without no clear ideas, what they were doing here, they're taking things. Mm, I don't know, destructing. She was also talking about destructions. They, they shoot at, uh, at the kitchen, at, uh, at, at computers, sets. computers and uh, TV sets and all the kinds so of the, things. So the violence, uh, well, this is a popular term, unprovoked invasion, <clears throat> unprovoked violence. Violence which doesn't have a reason. Violence which is which doesn't have any sense. So you just, in a room, you just shoot from your Kalashnikov to a TV set. Or to, because uh, you know, just don't know how to switch you, it on. Maybe you don't know how to switch it on. Maybe you just do it for fun. Maybe because you you were drunk. Because there were lots of also stories that imagine Ukrainian houses. Usually in the Ukrainian houses, you can you can have lots of alcohol, the self-made alcohol, the peasants, what we call samohon, the 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 the, the good, high-quality self-made alcohol, and. Uh, we can we can imagine that they drank all of it when they were yeah. staying, right? Yes. Yeah. So this group of people who lived under occupation in Makariv, they are a minority. Fortunately enough for them, they are a min- minority, but still they we were lucky to talk to them because this is important to document all these testimonies. But people who were inside Makariv but who resisted, they are. They were really strong guys uh, organizing evacuation, and let's stress once again that. Um, that uh, when Grad arrived to this culture center, Russians knew that it was evacuation center because it's quite clear there were buses, two school buses evacuating people every day. Uh, and when it was shelled on the 10th of March, it was in the process. So people were preparing to evacuate. So it was kind of a, kind of a strike against civilians. So it's quite clear, and at the same time, the whole center of uh, t- at least two two streets uh, in the center of Makariv, Shlachetska uh, and uh, Projektna, two streets are uh, severely da- damaged. M- maybe not completely destroyed, but a lot of a lot of houses are destroyed. Yes, and we also filmed a house. Uh, you can also watch it on our Twitter. Completely destroyed house of a music teacher. You can see the remnants of the piano, and what strikes you is that the flowers, which are which are around the the house, and it seems that, as we were explained by her neighbor, that this woman comes to this house just to take care of the flowers, and this is a pattern also we see uh, in different villages. So, you go through a destroyed village and you see how 
people continue working on their land, how they continue cultivating their land. Um, so Ukrainians, despite all the strategies, continue to live, to 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 look to the future, to take care of their, their belongings, of their land, of their fruits, of the vegetables, of their flowers. And this is something remarkable. I think another emotion that we can fix, that we can confirm, is that these people who live through the occupation feel extremely strong. They feel extremely strong. They are smiling. They are... They, 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 are, they are feeling that they went through something very horrible and therefore they are capable of, of anything after this. After this, you're just capable of anything. This is just a huge experience. So the word trauma, I don't really like this word trauma. I think, I think many of these people became stronger after this, not weaker. Yeah, but this is not... Uh, they can have a trauma, but it, uh, also be strong at the same time. We were, we were very much impressed by their openness. So people so so open to talk, they don't hide anything. If you are filming something, they approach and they uh, they saying, hi, what are, what are you interested in? So they're easy, re- really easy going and explaining everything and explaining circumstances and stories, telling their stories without any any fear, you know, they don't look really traumatized in that way. But um, at the same time, um, the distractions are really severe and for many people lost um, their homes. There is a mobile homes organized uh, in uh, in Makariv, uh, close to hospital, uh, there, um, and they will be putting people... At the moment we visited Makariv, there were no people living. They were preparing the lists of people to live there. And uh, they will be. And I, I was also impressed by the fact that many people started uh, the reconstruction of their houses before the state, Ukrainian state, could provide any kind of financial help. This is important. We were asking questions: Are you waiting for financial help of Ukrainian state um, to, to restore something? And at least several people were saying, "We are." independent enough to do it ourselves. There are people who suffered, suffered much more than we did. So they were trying to to do themselves several things just to, to put some room for people who suffered and who cannot afford any kind of reconstruction at the moment. And let, let's also talk about these multi-story buildings, which are also present in Makariv. In Makariv, you have a couple of uh, five-story buildings um, kind of on this uh, uh, Projektna Street, and uh, these houses were also destroyed. At least we've seen a couple of them. Uh, some of them were destroyed um, by tanks, tanks shelling at these multi-story buildings. Just imagine. So it was e- extremely clear it was uh, civilians. There were civilians inside, and just an image. You have this multi-story building, and you have a uh, a huge black hole in the middle after this shelling of the tank. But the rest of the building is more or less okay. And people are already back and people are living close to this. So they're living in the building which is which was touched by this shelling. And you see a lot of kids, we were impressed to see a lot of kids playing in the playground close to this multi-story buildings. And everything looks as if it's normal life and normal summer uh, as previous year, for example. But there is this this huge hole in the center of of your multi-story building. So this is something um, really impressive. It's not like in Borodyanka. In Borodyanka, the destruction was much higher in a way because there were bombs uh, bombs and the massive destruction, and you cannot restore these buildings. Or, for example, in in Saltivka in Kharkiv, you cannot live in such houses. But in in Makari, if you see this, I don't know this the signs of war and people living close to this this terrible black hole, the fire, and they are continue to live. Let's talk about solidarity. Uh, solidarity during this war. So the stories we were told that, for example, in this culture center, it uh, it uh, actually worked as a shelter because there was no big another big building uh, where people could could hide themselves. And this is also the pattern of this war. 
the big buildings for example let's 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 remember let's recall the drama theater in mariupol in which many civilians were hiding themselves unfortunately tragically for them because russians uh, just threw the 500 kilogram bomb on this building but in makariv the situation prob- probably in the smaller scale but also the kind of the scale. same because it was used for uh, to to as a shelter for many people i think we were told about from 80 to 100 people and um, and uh, and at one moment i think it was 10th of march russians decided to shell it with yeah, grass, it was 10th of march, right yeah. mm-hmm. um but uh, when, for example, they were collecting these people for shelter, other people were bringing lots of lots of assistance, food. Uh, we were told they were bringing this uh, kind of uh, kitchen equipment to make food. This was until the moment when uh, they still have ele- electricity, right? So this is ki- kind of solidarity of a village uh, to, to to help other people. Another form of solidarity is already after after the the liberation people were coming from all over ukraine and even people like we were told about the group of people from the tv project which is called the league of laughter which is mm-hmm. an entertainment uh, entertainment tv project where the comics are making stand ups like everywhere in the world so they were coming just to help with uh, with reco- not reconstruction but with making putting things in order Etc. Cleaning streets, cleaning streets, cleaning. Uh, mm-hmm. etc. Also, international support. We were told that, for example, Japanese, the Japanese, Japanese uh, to took uh, w- w- make make a mentorship over. I think one library, of, the, library. of the of library. the library. They will restore it. As far as I understood, they were they made plans to restore completely restore the library which was uh, de- destro- destroyed during this war. Denmark uh, also an organization from Denmark is taking care of the center for family medicine i think there was also yeah there was also people in the uh kinder house how do you say it the uh, the orphans orphan orphans. center i think yes uh that there were uh, 29 people kids who, kids, kids yes 29 kids and and one adult who was accompanying them who spent one month in italy and Italians just uh, take took care of them, so lots of lots of stories like this, both and national and international. And do you know that just the day after our visit to Makariv, the ambassador of United States visited Makariv once again, just also to to support people and to maybe to build up some projects with Makariv. So this is also important, and people are really glad to to receive all this uh, mm, all this uh, help. In fact, because they really need it. Yes. Interestingly enough, that Makariv is now also a place where internally displaced people living from uh, from places in which we have hot war right now, from eastern Ukraine, from southern Ukraine. And actually, our idea is to visit them and talk to them. What does it mean to and ask them what does it mean to flee the the the, 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 the places of the war and have a shelter in another place which was also touched by the war but in which you can you can already live mm-hmm. so ukraine is is like that you know it's 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 a country full of wounds in some places wounds are still you know full of blood in, in some other places these wounds are are recovering but uh, I think that, that the experience, so many people have the experience of this war right now, that this solidarity, I hope that the, it, was, it, was, it, will be, it, will be, it will be much larger. Another thing is that during the evacuation, also we were told by, by, by this Ludmila who was organizing this evacuation, that so much support from other regions, other regions which were helping these these people on these buses which were organizing their uh, accommodation at schools for example organizing their food this is also the stories that we've heard the fantastic stories that actually uh, if you were traveling if you were traveling at that time march april primarily march if, through different regions like to the western ukraine you would always 
have a possibility to to stay in a kind of a shelter organized by the local authorities, mm -hmm. right? So at the same time, maybe also important uh, to mention that uh, we ask people how many people are back to Makariv for those who left Makariv in the beginning, and at least several people were talking about some somehow seventy percent even in in these uh, multi-story buildings which are partially destroyed. So people are really back. They they want to rebuild their houses, even if the conditions are quite difficult. So we are now we are in summer, so there is no um, technical problem to live uh, in such house. But if winter comes, so you do need heating, you do need a lot of things which are much more difficult to, to do, to restore. So 70% of people living in a... In a partially destroyed uh, multi-story building it's 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 huge it's huge it means that it's important for ukrainians to come back it's important to be on their own land to 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 um, to take care of your flowers even if your house in is in ruins and coming back to the story of the flowers and the woman who's taking care of her flowers around ruins, the house which was ruined by Russians, it was built uh, f by four generations of her family. Yeah, so remembering the famous uh, phrase of Voltaire, uh, it's time to take care about uh, your garden, but in this situation you have your garden but you no longer have your house. So uh, let's sum up, let's make a conclusion. And uh, if I ask you for a conclusion, what would you say? What 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 the key impressions from visiting Makariv? I think that Makariv shows us the story of uh, the extreme solidarity, and um, solidarity of people of the community, where people who are active in culture, who are dance teachers or director of culture center, are able to organize evacuation. Uh, um, uh, are ready uh, are capable to organize the living in this uh, village which is in on the front line which is real battlefield during the war it's also a story of courage of people who are back to this partially destroyed uh, town which are not afraid to take responsibility for their partially destroyed houses and who are here who work hard to restore what they have to to to, to cultivate their land and their garden um, and who are able to live through the trauma even the hardest one of the death of your relative on, or rape uh, for example woman the tragic story of which we told you she is still in Makariv and she went to walk and as we were told by her neighbor, uh, she is working in a hospital and uh, now when she walks she is more or less okay so she continues to live despite the tragedy which happens to her during the war. Yes, uh, this was uh, our account of the trip to Makariv, the town near Kiev which was heavily heavily suffered from the war but as we can see the life goes on and people are strong enough to continue this life. This was a podcast explaining Ukraine by ukraineworld.org. Ukraine World is brought to you by Internews Ukraine, one of the biggest and oldest Ukrainian media NGOs. Uh, my name is uh, Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm uh, chief editor of ukraineworld.org. I'm talking to <coughs> Tetyana Harkova, who's in charge of international outreach at Ukraine Crisis Media Center. You can support us on patreon.com slash ukraineworld. We spend a big amount of your support on our volunteer trips, including this one. And um, you can follow us on social networks, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We put a lot of these podcasts on, on YouTube, but also on SoundCloud, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. Stay with us and stand with Ukraine.